everyone, and welcome to the sixth installment of the Learning Adobe FrameMaker Essentials webinar series. My name is Barb Binder, and I'll be your host today. I'm here to talk about the review and collaboration workflow in FrameMaker, as well as create a list of effective pages. If you've attended the other webinars, you already know who I am. If not, very briefly, I'm the owner and lead instructor at Rocky Mountain Training. I've been training on FrameMaker since the early 90s. Version 3 was my first version of FrameMaker. Uh, I'm an Adobe Community Expert and volunteer my time on the community forums. If you have any questions about FrameMaker and you ask us on the forums, I'm going to see your questions and probably try to answer them for you. There's lots of us, though, that help out on the forums, so I'm not the only one. And I've been a continuously certified Adobe instructor since 1997. If you would like to stay in touch after this webinar, please take a screenshot of this page. This has my business email, my website. I have a blog that answers lots of FrameMaker questions asked by my students over the years. And the best way to get answers to your questions is on the Adobe Community Forums. Okay, so let's begin to discuss the review and collaboration workflow. I'm going to start with track text edits and then roll directly into change bars. Track text edits is a feature that allows the editor to enter edits in a way that they are visually highlighted so that you can accept or reject their changes. This is a great feature if everyone in the process has access to FrameMaker. So say you're the subject matter expert and you're writing the content, you or somebody else is doing the layout in FrameMaker, and then you want to run the document by an editor for their review. If they have access to FrameMaker, they can enable track text edits. And as they start making their suggestions about what you should be adding and deleting to the document, FrameMaker is going to highlight them. And then the subject matter expert can come back and accept or reject those changes. I do want to say, though, that I've got a QR code there that's going to take you to a list of what FrameMaker can and cannot highlight when the editor is entering changes. If you'd like to get that complete list, just point yourself on at the QR code. It will take you to FrameMaker's user guide and directly to the table that shows you what it can and cannot do. Basically, it's able to track text edits. So it's going to track when the editor suggests that you add or delete text using their keyboard, or if they're cut copying and pasting text, if they're saying you should insert delete anchored frames, or footnotes or work with headers and footers. It's all very text focused. There are things that are beyond track text edits capabilities to highlight. If the editor says you should add a row and they add a new row in there, it's not going to show that to you with a highlight. Same thing with editing uh, content in cross references and markers and equations or manipulating the content of an anchored frame. If they think you should add or remove an anchored frame, that will show up. But if they change the graphic inside, that's not going to get highlighted. So look at that list to see what you can and can't do with this feature before you commit to it. And that said, let's go look at FrameMaker. So I'm in FrameMaker 2022. That is the current version as of this recording. However, the features I'm talking about in this webinar haven't changed in years. So any version of FrameMaker can benefit from the tips I'm going to give you if you need to use them. Um, I want to start with track text edits, and the first thing we do is we define the scope, what it is we want to check, and then we turn it on. Both of those commands live in two different places in FrameMaker. You'll find them in the edit menu. If you come down to track text edits, you define the scope, and then you enable track, enable track text edits. Or you can just go to the view menu, and you can ask to see the track text edits toolbar. Either way is fine. From either location, the first thing you do is determine what it is you want to enable tracking in. That's the scope. I'm going to do it for the document. This is a short webinar. I've got lots to talk about. So I'll set the scope for the document. But you could be in a book file and you could set the scope for the entire book. Here's my tip, though. If any of your book files have problems associated with them, for example, maybe some of them have missing fonts or some of them uh, have unresolved cross-references, those errors will prohibit FrameMaker from enabling track text edits in those particular files. So the way you get around it is you go to your book window, 
you use the shift key, go to the file menu, you open all the files in the book, and then you enable track text edits for the entire book. All right, so I'll stick with document. So I'm going to enable track text edits. Here we go. Uh, now I'm going to come down here and make a few changes. So I'm going to say, um, I want this to say this updated section provides, let's say, just background information. Don't need the word general about the vehicle and its various fuel systems. So those are going to be my edits. Um, I'm showing you three different types of edits in that one little paragraph. This is a replacement situation. This is removing something and this is adding something. You need to keep an eye on the spaces because that's where this will fall apart. It's like conditional text. If you ever use that feature, spaces will make or break that feature. Same thing with this. You got to watch the spaces. I think I did it right, but we'll know in just a minute. Um, once these have been added, in theory, someone checks the whole entire document more than just the first paragraph. You can then go up to the uh, toolbar and you've got a couple ways of looking at the document. Preview final is going to show what would happen if I were to come all the way over here and just blindly accept all the changes. So I'm going to click on it, preview final. And I'm just checking for spaces first because I was worried, but it looks like I got it right. This updated section provides background information about the vehicle and its various fuel systems. That looks great. So I could now accept all. I'm not going to. Um, the second preview option is to preview the original. This is what it was before I started. It just said this section provides general background information and its fuel systems. And then to see the highlighted version, I just turned the preview off. And now I can see exactly what the editor has done. Now, it's be careful just choosing accept all because that can cause problems, especially across a book where you can't see every problem that you're creating until it's done. I definitely recommend looking at each of the changes and decide if you want to keep them or not. Um, but over here, we have all the buttons that are used to move through the document and make decisions about keeping these changes or not. Um, there's a pair of buttons at the beginning. This one says accept, edit, and show next. This is reject, edit, and show next. Then we have the navigation button, oh, sorry, the, the accept and reject buttons for whichever one is highlighted. Then we have the navigation buttons, show next and show previous. And then finally, the scary to me, accept all and reject all buttons. What I'm going to do is go ahead and show next. My cursor is on line one. So when I choose the show next button, it's going to highlight the first correction. And I'm thinking, OK, I like that. So I'll accept that change. And that's this button right here. Um, now I can either accept it and go to the next one, or I can just accept it and then manually move forward. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to accept this and go to the next one. And I'll accept that and go to the next one. And maybe I think that general really should be there. and I don't like that change. That's where I can reject this and go to the next one. And then I think that's probably a good addition. So I'll go ahead and accept that and go to the next one. And there aren't any many anymore. So it says I'm done. So that's track text edits. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, disable it now because if I leave it on, anything I do is going to have that red and green highlighting showing up. And speaking of red and green, red and green is the default color system that Adobe has come up with for FrameMaker documents. There is a um, group of men out there that have a red green colorblind uh, disability. So in that case, you, you might find it hard to read red and green. You can modify the colors. That command lives in the edit menu. It's under track text edits and it specifically configure color. So if you didn't like the forest green and the red, you could change either or both of those to whatever else you want that to be. I'm going to cancel it. So that's track text edits. Let's move on now to change bars. Change bars are going to put a little bar in the margin next to a line where you have edited the document since the last time. Change bars are often used in conjunction with an editor to alert them to where you have made changes. So let's say that you get your manuscript completed and you send it out to the editor. They read the whole thing. They come back with the corrections. Before you begin to enter the corrections, you turn on automatic change bars. 
then every place where you've edited the document, a bar is going to appear in the margin area, and the editor can then focus in on those lines and ignore the lines where you didn't change anything. That will save them some time. Let me show you what that looks like. So in this document, I'm going to go to the Format menu. I'm going to come down to Document, and I'm going to click on Change Bars. By clicking on change bars, I then open up the change bar properties where I can specify what the bars are going to look like. My change bars are going to be a quarter inch from the margin guides. The thickness is going to be two points. Mine are going to be on the left side. They can be on the left or the right or alternating from left to right pages. I'll keep them black and I want to go ahead and turn them on. And when I choose set, FrameMaker is now going to put a bar wherever I edit something. So as an example, let's say I want to put this back to what it was before. I just want to say the section. You'll see now that a change bar is going to appear on the left side, a quarter inch from the margin, two points wide, color black. If I come down here and decide I no longer need the word auxiliary, I can select it and I can press delete, and that's going to create the change bar over here. So if you enter the edits with change bars on, that's going to help the editor zero in exactly where you're making the modifications. However, you can also turn them on manually. And one of the things that my students will do is they will highlight regulations for the final document so that the reader knows that something has changed. They're not doing this for the editor. This has gone through the editors. Now they're doing it in the final output. So say that this is a new concept, rocket-based flights. It's a new regulation. It wasn't here last year. I want to let the reader know that this is new this year. I can make a selection, and I can go up to Format, and I can come down to uh, Style, and then go ahead and click on Change Bar. That's going to introduce a manual change bar. So I can put them in wherever I want. Um, there are two additional ways of adding change bars, and it's through the designers. The character designer has a change bar attribute you can enable for a character style, and the paragraph designer has a change bar attribute you can enable for the paragraph style. Now, once you have the change bars in place, you can decide you want to remove them. You can remove them individually, or you can remove them all at once. Uh, and you can remove any of these individually. It could be any of the ones that I see here that can be removed. I'll go ahead and just grab this one again, um, but I can do this for any of these single change bars. I just make a selection. I go back to format. I go back to style. This time I'm going to uncheck change bar, and that's going to remove it. If I want to remove all change bars because I've now, the editor has now seen everything and I want to start over again with the next round of edits, I would go back up to the format menu. I would come back down to document and I would click on change bars and I would choose to turn off change bars for the moment and then clear all change bars. There is no undo. Uh, just be aware of that. I've got the alerts turned off so it shows up in the dialog box but you're not going to see the extra dialog box that's it's telling me that again. I just keep those turned off because I'm not worried about the undos. Um, if you see that my undo is still available up here, that's because you can undo the edits, but you can't undo the clear change bars. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and pick set, and that's going to remove the change bars for everything. So again, you can use change bars in conjunction with track text edits if you want to. You can use them separately. They're a way to alert the editor that you've made a change on a line and have them recheck it. But they also could be used manually if you decide you want to alert your readers to changes from last year's manuals. Next up is a quick look at Document Compare. FrameMaker can compare two versions of a document to show you what has changed. It can compare not just text changes between the two versions, but also footnotes, markers, anchored frames, text insets, variables, and cross-references. This is handy if you are entering edits because you can save your file before you begin to enter your edits, save it again after the edits, and then compare the two to make sure that you did everything you were supposed to do, and also ensure that you didn't mess anything up. Let me show you what that looks like. So back in FrameMaker, I want to make sure I save this file before I begin to enter edits. I'm going to go to the File menu and just choose Save. And then I'm going to immediately go back to the file menu and save this as a different name. I'm going to change the name to revised. And now I'm going to enter a few basic edits. For example, I'll say um, this updated section 
and I'll delete the word um, general and I'll add various here. I'm going to scroll down a little bit and I'm going to add a footnote. That's going to be insert menu. I'll come down to footnote and just type in new note. And I'm going to make a formatting change because I want to point this out. Uh, this is a heading one. Let's say I want to change what it looks like. I'm going to go to the paragraph designer and I'm going to change the color from corporate primary, which is my blue, to corporate secondary, which is a green. And I'm going to make it regular and then update style. Now that's a formatting change, not a text change. And I want to show you that FrameMaker is not going to recognize that that's something that's different. And once I've made a few changes, I'm going to go ahead and save this file again. And then I want to compare the two versions. I need to be in the revised file to start the compare, but I also need the other file open. So I'm going to go up to File, Recent Files. I'll pick up the general description file I saved at the beginning, and then I'm going to return to the revised version. The command that I want to show you is in the file menu under utilities, compare documents. I need to be in the newer file for this to work. And then FrameMaker is guessing the older file is general description. It's guessing correctly because it's the only file open. But if you had other files open, you could pick the correct one from the list. Now, FrameMaker can either create a summary document or a summary and composite document. Let's do both so you can see what they both look like and see which one you want to use or if you want to use both. And then before I click the compare button, I'm going to turn options on. And options let you see what we can control about the process. FrameMaker is going to mark anything that I have added to the second document as inserted. It's a condition tag inserted. It's going to be assigned the color green and underline. It's going to mark anything that I deleted from that file with a condition tag called deleted. It's going to be read and strike through. These are going to look like the track text edit changes, but it's not using track text edits. It's using conditional text. It's also going to mark any changes with change bars so they're visible on the margin. And it's going to create links in the summary document. When I choose set, FrameMaker is going to compare these files. And then it's going to come up with two different documents for us to look at. The first one I want to show you is the summary document. And the summary document is going to give all the information about what it found. It shows you the file that you were in, what it's comparing to. It's got the modification dates. It says how many insertions and deletions and changes. And then it has the actual list of what has been modified. These are hyperlinks. That's one of the options you had. Um, and so if I'm thinking, oh, there's a new note, where is that? I can click on it and it will take me to the page that has the note. And if I scroll down, I'll see it down here. Now, this is actually the composite document I, I chose to hyperlink to. It's the CMP file compare, so um, or composite rather. So you can see now with the condition tags where I'm saying to delete things and where to add things. Um, that's an addition. It's flagging where I put the footnote marker and then the actual note itself. It doesn't know I changed the font or the formatting of the heading one. I wanted to show you that. But you can see that it's an, an easy way for you now to look at this and make sure that you did all the things you were supposed to do, which I think is great. And one more thing about the summary document. When I hyperlinked, I chose to hyperlink to the composite file. I could have linked to the newer file or the older file. All of these numbers have links on them. So I can hyperlink and see any of those. So I think that's really great. That's a FrameMaker feature you may not have known about. But then because it's not showing you the formatting, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to show you something outside of FrameMaker that you might find useful. I'm going to go ahead and close these two files. I'm not going to save them. And then I'm going to save both of my open documents as PDFs. I'm in the revised file. So I'll go to file. I'll choose save as PDF. Now I'm going to navigate to the general description file and do the same thing. I'm going to save it as a PDF. That's file, save as PDF. And then I'll go ahead and use the link from here to open up Acrobat.
So this one is open in Acrobat. This is the original file. Now I'm going to go open up the other file. I'll just use file open. Here's my revised document. And now I have them both open. They're both sitting side by side. So I'm in the newer file and I want to compare this with the older file. Adobe Acrobat also has a document compare feature and it's a little bit more robust than FrameMakers. So FrameMakers might be all you need and that's great, you've already got it. But if you happen to have a Adobe Acrobat subscription, you could do this here as well. The command is called document or compare files. I grabbed it from the tools and added it to my toolbar on the right. If you're looking for something in Acrobat, you click on tools, you type in the feature that you want and then you can add it. So I already did that. I'm going to go ahead back to my newer one and I'm going to click on compare files. Now it thinks the old one is the general description, which is correct with the, the blue. This is the newer one. I can see revised here and I'm going to go ahead and just use compare. And now Adobe Acrobat is going to compare the two files. So in Acrobat, I'm now being presented with something similar to what FrameMaker presented us with. It's got a summary of the changes um, on the left, and then it compares what's happening on the right. And then as I begin to scroll through this document, it's going to show me exactly what has changed. So it's doing the same thing that FrameMaker could do. But notice it's not showing the formatting change. Obviously, that looks different. FrameMaker doesn't have any way to show that to us, but Acrobat does. When you're working with Document Compare in Acrobat, you have a filter menu, and it's set to initially hide any formatting changes. You can say, I need to see the formatting changes, and it can then highlight those for you. So you can pick exactly what it's showing you. You get more control through Acrobat. Uh, I think this is something we're thinking about whether or not you want to do this in FrameMaker or in Acrobat, but definitely worth considering adding one of these to your workflow because it's a great way to see what you've changed and make sure you haven't changed anything extra, particularly if you're not working with an editor. When I'm working with an editor, I'm a little more relaxed about my editings, edits because I know they're going to find mistakes that I make. I'd rather not make any mistakes, but I'm not too worried about it. If the file goes from me directly to the printer, I am much more worried about it because I'm not a great editor. Uh, I'm good with FrameMaker, but I'm not great at editing. So this can be helpful for you. So let's get back to working with an editor. Let's say that they don't have FrameMaker or they don't want to purchase a subscription or don't want to learn it. They want to edit the documents and they want to do it electronically, but not using FrameMaker's track text edits. Another way to approach this is a PDF review. And there are three different ways to initiate a PDF review. You can send for a shared PDF review via email. You can send for a shared PDF review on a shared server, or you can send for an online PDF review. And I want to show you what those look like next. So here I am back in FrameMaker and I want to send this file out for an emailed PDF review. The first thing I want to do is go ahead and save it. So I'm clicking the diskette button up on the top and then I want to initiate the review. I'll do that by going to the file menu and choosing save as review PDF. And then I'm going to choose send through email. FrameMaker is going to ask me if I want to save this file in this location. That all looks good for me. I'm going to go ahead and choose save and then the PDF setup dialog box opens. There are two things to look out for before you continue. Number one, you need to enable generate PDF for review only. That needs to be checked. That's in the settings tab. And then in the tags tab, we want to make sure we have create tagged PDF turned on. So the settings tab and the tags tab, we need to have those two checked before we continue. Mine are both turned on, I'll go ahead and choose set. So FrameMaker is going to take us over to Adobe Acrobat and get started on initiating the email-based review. There are three steps we need to go through on this left-hand column. The first one is just confirming again the name and the location, still fine. I'll click next. And the second step is to add a list of the reviewers. I'll go ahead and add myself in here. We can have more than one reviewer, so you can add additional emails if you like. The final screen is going to just show you the wording of the email that's about to go out. This is the subject line, and here are the instructions that are going to be included in that email. 
So the editor who receives this for the first time knows exactly what's expected of them. I'm going to go ahead and choose send invitation and I'll open it up on a different computer. So I received the email on a different computer. This is a Mac. I'm not even on a Windows computer. And when I open up the PDF, it opens up Adobe Acrobat since I have it installed and it opens up the file. Now I've got clear instructions on this top line in addition to the ones that were included in the email. Basically it's going to say go ahead and enter your comments and then when you're done send them back to the author by clicking the send comments button. So uh, I'm allowed to enter in six different kinds of comments. Specifically, we can have text additions. So if I want to add a word, I can click here, for example, and type in various. If I'd like to delete a word, like I don't want background anymore, I can select it and I can press delete. And if I want to modify something, maybe I want to change um, the section to say, this updated section, I can select what's there and then add what I want to, to change. So I'll say is updated and spacebar and then I'll choose post. Now when I'm entering these edits, you can see them accumulating on the right hand side. I'm using strike through and insert and replace. These are tools that you'll see at the top of Adobe Acrobat up here, but you didn't see me clicking them because just typing on the page is going to invoke those tools automatically. It makes it very easy. Now there are three additional ways you can alert the FrameMaker user about your edits. Um, one of the things you can do is you can use the underline tool. So the underline and underline is typically a proofreader's mark for italics. So if I want them to italicize personal spaceship, I can click the underline tool and it's going to put italics there. I can comment on why I did it, but to me the underline means, hey Barb, you forgot to italicize that. Uh, in addition, we can also highlight something. And so maybe I'm questioning these words right here. I'm thinking, are those right? I don't know. Another option is to use a highlighter up here. And then I might want to go ahead and comment on why I did that. Is this correct? And then I can click post. And then finally, we can include sticky notes. Now, I'm not a big fan of sticky notes. Uh, but if you want to use them, of course, it's okay. They're a little hard to find in FrameMaker. I'll show you that in just a minute. And I do direct my editors to only use sticky notes for document-wide commands. Uh, I don't want them to say that I have a typo on every single page of a footer. In FrameMaker, we fix it on the master page and it rolls through the whole document. I just want one alert. So that's, to me, that's an appropriate use of a sticky note. Hey, you've got a problem here. Um, but let me show you how to do it. I'm going to put it up here at the beginning of the document. I'm going to click the sticky note and I'm just going to click it right here. And I'll just say, great job. And I'll choose post. And um, we've now got all these um, edits in the commenting panel on the far right side. So uh, I want to go ahead and save this file. And then I'm going to click on the send comments command. And when I click send, it's going to send it back to my other computer. So the email comes back to me. And when I open up the PDF in the email, it takes me back to Acrobat. And I get this screen asking if I want to merge the comments on the file that was just returned to me with the original PDF. And I do. Uh, if there's multiple reviewers, you can do this multiple times and you'll be able to get all of the collective comments in a single file. And you can see now that back on my Windows computer, all the comments are included in this file. What I then want to do is go ahead and save it. And then I'm going to return to FrameMaker and import these comments into FrameMaker. So here I am back in the original FrameMaker document. I have not modified it since I sent the file out for a review. And the next thing I'd like to do is import those comments into FrameMaker. So I'll go to the file menu. I'll choose import. And waiting for you to find it down here is the import comments command. When I click it, it's going to attempt to import the comments in, but it's going to give a dialog box that describes why it might not work. So you do want to read through this uh, to make sure everything is working. Some of the key points, make sure that you're using FrameMaker 9 or later. This is FrameMaker 2022. 
way past that. Make sure it's a tag PDF. I showed you where that check mark is. And then um, it must have been saved after commenting. I think I've met all the criteria here. I'll go ahead and choose yes. And I'm going to go ahead and import all the comments in. Now at this point, you're going to see a dialog box that opens up that says that I attempted to import six different comments, one of each of the supported types, zero misplaced, zero failed. When I pick OK, you'll then notice that a review panel opens itself up. I'm going to go ahead and just put over here with the paragraph catalog and you can see the review panel on the right hand side with all the same edits I was showing you in both of the versions of that Acrobat file. Meanwhile, on screen, you can see that the edits have come in, and these do use track text edits. Uh, you can accept and reject the changes either by using the buttons across the top, or you can use the buttons over here. Uh, either one's going to work. Now, I did mention that sticky notes are hard to see. In FrameMaker, a sticky note is actually just a marker. So if I have my marker box open and I double click on that marker, it tells me it's a sticky note and it says I did a great job. So now I know. Uh, I don't need to keep this here. So since I'm done reading it, knowing that they liked what I did, I'll delete the marker and that sticky note is going to be gone. You can see the marker is now gone. I'll close it. And um, from here, I can start to accept and reject the changes. Now, I do want to remind you that because this is using track text edits, we can use the preview buttons at the top. This one is preview final, and I can look and see if this looks okay. Um, looks like everything came in correctly, like I expected it to. I always worry about spaces because spaces can derail this. If you forget to, uh, to uh, indicate spaces when you're marking something for deletion or for replacement, you might get words with no spaces between them and words with two spaces. It reminds me of conditional text edits where you, people forget to worry about the spaces. Now, the markers are there because it's showing me where the, the corrections are. I can always go up to the view menu and hide the text symbols so I can check those spaces. It all looks good. Uh, I'm going to go to the original file for just a moment. Here's how it looked before we sent it out. Here is what it should look like when we're done. And again, this is the preview off. We're seeing it with the edits in real time. So now I want to go ahead and work through the document and accept and reject the changes that have been provided to me. Um, do note that at the top of the review panel, there are two very large navigation buttons. I have a hard time, as you've seen, finding the navigation buttons up here. I like these arrows. If I click the right pointing arrow, I'm going to navigate through all of the markup. And the left pointing arrow just navigates backwards through the markup. Uh, there is a button to accept all the changes globally. There's one to reject all the changes. You can have multiple reviewers. You can pick the reviewer's changes you're looking at if one is more important than the others. And then down below, we have the markup. Now, I do find that these buttons work sometimes and not other times. And I find myself when I'm using this workflow, using these buttons, but also using the ones across the top. Uh, that's just been my experience. Maybe it's just me. I'm not sure but just be aware that that might happen. I also run across some screen refresh issues, and so you'll see me using window refresh to update the page when I don't trust the selection that I'm looking at. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to navigate to the first the first uh, markup. And in theory, I can click the plus to the check mark to accept it. In reality, it didn't work. So I'll come up here and try it from here, and that one does work. So again, I'm just using both. I have them both open. I'm ready to go. Uh, if I click on this one, I'm going to expect that FrameMaker is going to tell me I don't have an insertion point. Let me try. Yep, it said no insertion point. And again, I don't know what that's all about. I'm just going to click here and I'm going to navigate to the next one. And now I have what looks like two selections. That's not really happening. So I'll, I'll go to the uh, window menu and choose refresh. And you can see it's just the second selection. But since I'm here, I'll go ahead and accept that one. That's this guy here. Now, again, the check isn't working, so I'll do it from up top. Good. And I'll come to this one and I will try the check mark. Once again, not working. Now, it does work for me some of the time. I just can't get it to work consistently. So what I'll do here is I'll just say, okay, these are fine. I'm going to accept all in just a minute. And then I want to come down here and just discuss these other two. Now, remember that this is meant to be markup for italics. This is a way to communicate that you want italics 
from an editor. So what I might do there is navigate to it and either reject it. I can choose the reject button or I could just reject all in a second, which I'll show you, and then come back and add the character style to italicize it. Um, and then when it comes to this last one, I don't know why it's highlighted. And that's always uh, a concern for me working with an editor. I try to talk to them in advance about how to best communicate their edits to me. If someone just randomly highlights something and doesn't take the time to add a comment, and I showed you that I could have added a comment when I was highlighting it in Acrobat, then I have to call and say, okay, why is that highlighted? What's, what's happening here? It's always nice to have an explanation when we're working. Um, okay. So uh, that said, I want to go ahead and just accept all these changes and I'll use this button here, which does work very reliably. So does reject. I'll go ahead and click the check mark. The frame maker is going to accept all of the changes. It made four updates in the document. When I pick OK, it's going to clear out the comments panel and it's going to have incorporated all of the markup into the document. So that is the first idea, the first concept of how to use an email based review. So let's talk about the second variation on this. The second one is to create a shared review on a shared server. And to initiate that, we go to the file menu, we come down to save as review PDF, and we choose send for shared review. I need to go through the saving process again. And that includes making sure we have the two check marks, one to generate PDF for review only in settings, and the other to make sure it's a tagged PDF. I'll go ahead and choose set. Now for the shared review, it's going to give a different set of instructions for how to proceed. And what you need to do is put the file on a shared server. I won't demonstrate it, but you can see the process. Um, you need to put it on your internal shared server. And then you go through the same thing I just showed you. People can comment and then you can collect the information. When I choose next, as if I'm going to continue, it's going to ask me if I want to use a network folder, do I want to use a SharePoint subsite or a web server folder. You'd have to set this up and then continue through the process. It's going to look just like what we did with the email-based review, only we're using that shared server. That's the difference. So now we're going to take a look at the last kind of online review. This one's different. It's still using a PDF but it's also going to use Adobe Document Cloud, which means you do have to have an Adobe Document Cloud subscription. I believe it comes with an Adobe Acrobat subscription. So if you have Adobe Acrobat Pro, you should also have the cloud subscription. And it's going to be a browser-based edit. So the, way, the person that's on the receiving end doesn't have to have Acrobat installed or even Reader installed if they don't want to. The other two could have been handled with Acrobat or Reader. So for this one, the way we initiate the online review is we go to the review menu and we come to the first command, which says send for online view. As the PDF is saved, it is sent to the document cloud. And then this dialog box pops up so that you can name the review and you can enter the email for one or more reviewers, clicking add after each reviewer is added. You can remove a reviewer. And you can also set a deadline and the reviewers will get email reminders to make sure they meet that deadline. Now, when I click send, it's going to initiate an email to all the reviewers listed. You can tell when the review email has been sent out, it's going to give you a confirmation. And it's also going to tell you that it uploaded the file to the Adobe document cloud. Each reviewer receives a unique link. And you can manage the reviews by clicking on that button to see a list of reviews that are active. You can see that I've got one active right now. You can edit the reviews, delete the reviews. You can also use this to import comments in from the review. I'm going to go now to a different computer to mark up this document. So I sent the email to myself from my Windows computer. It arrived on my Mac and I opened up the email. There was a link to open the PDF. And when I followed it, it brought me here. I'm not in Adobe Reader. I'm not in Adobe Acrobat. I'm actually in a browser window. And what's different about this review workflow is that the reviewer does not need to have any Adobe products. They don't have to own Acrobat or install Reader. They don't have to have any subscriptions. I know I said earlier that you have to have an Adobe Document Cloud subscription for this workflow. It's the initiator that has to have that Document Cloud subscription. Once they initiate it, it can be, this link can be emailed to anybody, and then anybody with a browser can begin to edit it. 
So that's what I'm going to show you here. There is a toolbox on the left and there are comments. Uh, the comments panel is on the right. There's currently no comments. Um, I do want to point out that there are things in here that FrameMaker is not going to understand. FrameMaker doesn't recognize freehand drawing. The idea behind freehand drawing, for example, is you might circle something with a big circle and then tell somebody what you want them to do there. That's not a possibility right now to bring into FrameMaker. So there's features in here we're not going to be able to use. Um, remember that FrameMaker markup is limited to six things. You can have text additions, deletions, and replacements. Also, sticky notes, underlined text, and highlighted text. That's what FrameMaker will understand from a review when you import it in. However, the online review is still being improved, and right now, we don't have access to inserting text. I just want you to be aware of that before you try this for the first time. I'll give you an idea of how to get around it, but that's how it is as of today. Um, so looking over here, I've got my sticky note tool, that's the comments, and then I have the following markup tools. I can highlight something, underline something, and strike through something. There's no option to insert text. So I'll show you what to do. Now, I'm not a big fan of switching tools back and forth, back and forth, because that's a lot of work. So what I'm going to do is just stick with the select tool, and I'll show you how I can avoid having to go over and choose tools from the toolbox. So I've got the select tool here. And I want to go ahead and start my markup. So the first thing I'm going to do is tell the um, FrameMaker person to remove the word background. So I'm selecting background and the space. And then you'll see a context sensitive toolbar pop up. That's how I'm going to avoid going over there and picking the tool. If I want them to remove the word background, I would indicate that with a strike through. Uh, if I would like them to underline something, I can indicate that with, sorry, if I want to italicize something, underline too, but we really don't use underline in printed documents. So if I want to indicate italics, I can use the context sensitive tool to click on underline. Now, not everyone knows that rule about don't underline in a document and do use italics. And so if I'm concerned that my frame maker person doesn't know that, I can always clarify any of my edits with a comment. And that's in any of these workflows. Always can add something to it. So I'm just going to write italics here and I'll hit post. And then um, if I want to in, add a word, which is not currently a feature of the online review, here's an idea. Uh, I could select a word, like I could select this content right here, and I could highlight it. And then I could clarify why I'm highlighting it, and I'll say um, various fuel systems, for example and post. Or I could just type in add the word various in front of fuel systems, which is more words. I'd rather have less when I'm typing. You've seen me type. I'm not a great typist, especially if somebody is watching. Now the third type of markup is a sticky note. And so I'm just going to go ahead and grab that sticky note and I'll put it right up here. And I'm going to say uh, overall, great job, C individual markups. And I'll hit post. Now that's all that we have to do. The editor is just going to comb through the document entering their markups. And because it's an online review using the Adobe Document Cloud server, these are being saved to the server immediately. So that means that the person that's on the other end who initiated the review can see these whenever they're ready. So to show you that, I'm back in FrameMaker again. I'm in the same document, and I want to see if there were any comments added. I can import the comments with several different commands. That Manage Review dialog box I showed you a few minutes ago is available right here. I can manage online reviews, and I can open that back up again just by going up to the Review menu and asking for it. As I said earlier, it's going to show all the reviews. Here's the one we're working with. If I click it, I can choose to import comments. There's also an import comments button over in the review panel if it's open. I'll do it from here since I just opened it up. And I'll pick import comments. Yes, I am sure. And now it's importing the comments from the document cloud. You can see in the background that they've arrived. I'm going to go ahead and close the Manage Online Reviews dialog box and then show you that you can see the markup on my FrameMaker page. You can also see the comments that are happening over on the right-hand side. 
Um, this first green uh, marker is the uh, sticky note, right? And you can see it's right here. I can read it. Uh, and I can just read it and ignore it. I showed you earlier, if you want to remove it, you can remove it from the marker box by just selecting it and then deleting the marker. But you can also just read it and leave it there until you're done. And then when you accept all the changes, it will go away. Um, now to go and see the other things that were being added, um, we can, again, we can use the navigation buttons from up here that you can also navigate through the markup with these two bigger black arrows. So if I click on this one, it's going to go to the first one and I can choose to accept or reject that change. Um, do keep in mind that once again, we have the previews. So if you're trying to look and see what it's going to look like when you accept them all, you can see it in that view. Markers are always uh, problematic because they block spaces. You know, I'm very concerned about spaces. So if I go to the view menu and I go to text symbols and turn them off and refresh my screen, uh, control L is window refresh. I can then see that that all looked really good. Um, this is the original if I want to see it. This is the markup again. Um, so I'm showing you how you can navigate and you can accept and reject your changes as you go. Now, when it comes to fuel systems, I'm thinking, well, wow, why was that highlighted? I can look over here and see that somebody wants me to add various fuel systems. So I could click right here, for example, and add the word various. And then as I navigate through, I'll go past that one. Um, the next one it's going to come to is going to be the personal spaceship. And I think, wow, why is that underlined? And I can see down here that it says to italicize it. So I can remove that markup and then I can italicize it using a character style, perhaps. Um, you can do these as you go or you can do them all at once. I'm a big fan of as you go, but I want to show you everything. So if you look at the top of the review panel, there is an accept all uh, button. So if I click on that, accept all the markup, accepted all the changes, mm -hmm. and it's going to also clear out the review panel at that point, including the um, sticky note that I just left there as I was talking. Okay, so that is a look at the three review workflows you can use that don't rely exclusively on FrameMaker. If your editor or editors don't have FrameMaker, don't want to learn FrameMaker, don't want to get a subscription, you can either initiate an email-based review, a review on a shared server, or the online review. Um, all three are good workflows. I think the online review view is going to be the way it will have us do this in the future, but we need to get a little bit further with the features that are included in that. And they're coming. Okay, so that completes our look at the review and collaboration workflow features within FrameMaker, either uh, being handled solely in FrameMaker or along with a PDF. Um, that this has all been about making sure that the edits that are required to be entered have been entered in correctly. Uh, now there's one more thing I wanna look at with you and that's a list of effective pages. A list of effective pages is typically a table that appears in the front of a book that lists all the pages where a change has been made since the last revision. So if you wanna do that, FrameMaker can generate that for you. It's just a list of paragraphs but you have to set it up so that it's ready to go. And my observation is that people that are trying to create a list of effective pages for the very first time struggle with step one because they're not clear that there are two kinds of frames in FrameMaker. You can have either template frames or background frames. And for this to work, you have to work with template frames. Um, and so people often are just stuck right at step number one and never get through the rest of the sequence. I want to go ahead and show you exactly how to set up a list of effective pages. So here I am in FrameMaker, and now I've got a book open. I'm going to click in my book, hold my shift key, and choose File, Open All Files in Book. That's going to open up all the files in the book sequentially because it's quicker to update files in a book if they are open. And I want to get through this relatively quickly. Uh, now I'm going to be putting in the information needed for this chapter, Chapter 1, General Description. It's already in the other two chapters, uh, Operating Limitations and Systems, and you can put it in as many chapters as you need. So um, what this entails is adding a frame somewhere on the body pages that can collect the revision numbers and the contents so that as you are making changes on the page, you go up and you edit that content. Um, the list of effective pages is going to grab the chapter number, if you want it, the page numbers for sure, 
along with revision numbers and the revision dates. So I need to put a frame here that's going to collect the revision numbers and revision dates. I want it on every single page, and that's definitely going to be a master page activity. So I'm going to head to the view menu. I'm going to come down to master pages. And in my graphics toolbar, I can add text frames with this tool right here. So I'm going to go ahead and say that I want to add a text frame. And once I add it, I'm going to get a dialog box asking me what kind of text frame I want to add. And this, the answer to this question is going to be really important. A background text frame is intended for headers and footers. Um, up here where you can see my chapter number and my page number, that's a background frame. My footer is also a background frame. We add background frames to the, to the master pages, and then we can see the contents on the body pages, but we can't change it. And the key to being able to do a list of effective pages is to have a place where you can actually type in the numbers and the dates as they change. In that environment, you absolutely have to have a template frame. And so I'm choosing template frame right here. Uh, this main frame and behind me, that's a template frame. That's part of every new FrameMaker document. So whether or not you've identified these frames by names, you've been using background frames and template frames since the first day you started using FrameMaker. Uh, now, I do not want to append this frame onto the main template flow. So I'm going to change the template uh, flow tag, template frame flow tag to B. So it's going to be a different flow. I don't want any of the text from my from my body pages flowing into these uh, little frames. So I'm giving it a different flow tag and I'll click add. And then I want to make sure that auto connect is not turned on and I know that it will be. So I'm going to go to the graphics menu and come down to object properties. And I can see that I've assigned the flow tag B, but that auto connect is turned on because that's the default. It takes two clicks to turn it off. Now, the reason I'm turning it off is that I do not want my dates and, and numbers to flow from one frame to the next. I want to have them on one page and then the next page and the next page with no chance of them moving through the document to the wrong page. Uh, from here, I'm going to go ahead and click apply. And then I'm going to double click to type inside. Now, you have to put the content in these frames and I'm going to put in sample content. Uh, one of the rules about template frames is anything you type into a template frame does not appear on the body pages. You have to put the content in the template frames on the body pages. So many rules. Um, and let me go ahead and put in a sample date as well. So now I've got a sample number and a sample date um, on, the, on the master page. Again, it's just for reference. And then I need to format it. So I would typically put something that identifies this as a revision number and this is a revision date. It could be a background frame that sits next to it and just has it the text sitting right here and repeats like our page numbers do. That's a possibility. In this demo, I went ahead and went with styles. So if I click on the 000, I have a style in my paragraph catalog that's called revision number. And when I click it, it's going to format it the way I want it to look. I've also got one for revision date, and I'm going to format that as well. Now, the reason the words are showing up is because I programmed those in. I went over how to work with numbering properties in a webinar that was entirely devoted to numbering properties. You can find it on YouTube if you haven't seen it yet. But if you look at my paragraph designer and numbering, you can see that I added the words that I needed at the beginning of each of those paragraphs. That's why they're there. It's one technique. You can also just put it on in a background frame. Okay, so I think this looks good, um, and that takes care of the right master, but I need to have this on the left master as well. So I'm going to go ahead and select this frame. I'm going to copy it and then scroll up to the previous page. I'll click on page the left master so I know that it's selected, and then I'll go ahead and paste. And one of the things about FrameMaker is it always pastes in the exact same spot it came from, so that's a nice thing. Um, this all looks good. I'll click Add. But I want this to be on the left side, so I'm going to hold my shift key now and then drag it to the left and snap it into the left margin. So I've got it on the left side at this point. And then I want to make sure auto connect properties is turned off. I think it's probably back on again. That's graphic object properties. I want to make sure auto connect is not enabled. Two clicks turns it off and then I click apply. And now I've got these template frames set up. Again, a template frame lets you add content on the body pages. Now, the content you see here was just for my um, visual way of confirming I formatted it correctly. When I head back to the body pages, that content's not going to be there. 
probably could delete it here and should delete it here, but for now I'm going to leave it. And then I'm going to go to the view menu and go to the body pages. And um, all that we're seeing is the assigned paragraph style. That's why those words are there. The style of uh, called uh, RN revision number is sitting here. So it already has those words, but nothing else is going to be there. So the next thing I need to do is just add in some sample content to start. What I'm going to do is go to each of these 12 pages and type in the revision number and the revision date. Again, it's going to be 062823. And I'm not going to make me you watch me do all of them. I'll be back in just a sec. Okay, so I went ahead and added in the sample text at the beginning uh, or at the top of all of the body pages of this document. There are quicker ways of doing it than just typing it in. You can use copy and paste. Uh, there's quick ways to get the text in there, but you need to have something to start with. Uh, and so now I'm ready to um, save my file. And then um, I want to point out that I've already done this for the other two files. Operating limitations and systems already have that content in there. Same uh, location for the frames, same styles, etc. Now, I do want to say that you might want to think for a moment about whether or not you want to include your chapter numbers. Uh, if you're using FrameMaker, you, I'm sure you know how to put chapter numbers in there. Uh, it's the chap num variable. Uh, but something I know some of my students don't know is how to put in text as chapter numbers. I just wanted to show you that. So in the table of contents, if you need to have a TOC in there, you can do that just by changing the numbering properties in um, you know the appendix, table of contents, other front and back matter areas to a text string. People just don't know that, so I'm popping that in there because it comes up a lot when people are talking to me about their list of effective pages. So that's just a chapter number. Instead of using the normal chapter number, uh, number we're using text. So that's in there. Um, however, I did not include the revision numbers on there, so you're not going to see that in the the list of effective pages, although you could had I included it. All right, so the next thing to do is to go ahead and add a list of paragraphs. I'm going to add it, um, let's see, I'll, I'll add it in front of my table of contents. So I'm going to go to the insert menu, I'm going to come down and choose list of, and I want a list of paragraphs. That's what I'm looking for. So I'll pick a list of paragraphs, and it's going to use the suffix LOP. Remember that the suffix is going to appear in the file name. So this file name is my book name plus a suffix, spaceship LOP. It's going to appear in the style names when FrameMaker copies the content over. There's also going to be an LOP reference page. And reference pages is where you manage the presentation. Now, this is a list of paragraphs. And specifically, what I'm looking for are the revision numbers and revision dates. I can double click them in no particular order because they always appear alphabetically, but when they're typed up, they'll appear in chronological order. So I've got the dates and the numbers. I'm gonna pick okay, and I'm gonna pick update. And FrameMaker is gonna think that through and it's now gonna comb through all the documents and it's gonna pull in the list and it's made a file. And here it is in a raw format. All you're seeing here is the revision number, the page number, the date, and the page number. So that's not very well formatted. I definitely need to spend some time formatting it, um, which I'm not going to do during this class. Let me dock it, though, before I continue. Um, but I want to make sure everyone understands that when you get this raw list, be happy because the content that you need is here. The way that you fix it, make it look the way you want, is always going to be on those reference pages. There is an LOP reference page, and we just have to juggle these building blocks around to look the way we want. Now, I already have a formatted uh, list of paragraphs. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open that up. Uh, I'm going to go to my Assets folder, and I have my formatted LOP. And you can see that it has the um, text chapter number. It has a title. It, I want this to look more like a uh, table. Even though you can't have a generated file that's literally in a table, it's going to look like a table and then it's going to be two columns. And I've got the headings already in there. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and close my um, formatted LOP, not save it. And I'm going to go ahead and close my unformatted LOP and not save it. Then I'm going to go to my folders and I'm going to reuse that generated file. And again, I talked about this in a webinar on generated files. Once again, on YouTube, you can find it. 
So I'm going to grab the formatted LOP and just put it in the folder where um, FrameMaker is going to look for it. And then uh, I'll remove this from the book. And I'm going to add it in one more time. I'll go to the insert menu. I'm going to choose the same thing, list of paragraphs, same paragraphs. There they are, revision date, revision number. I'll pick OK. And what happens when I have a sample LOP or any generated file sitting in the same folder with the name FrameMaker is expecting it to use, FrameMaker will pour the content into that and it'll be fully formatted the first time you see it. So as I go over to the LOP, you can see now it's formatted. It seems a little small. Let's make that a bit bigger. Uh, let's go to 100%. There we go. And I want to pull it back here. And you can now see that it's formatted. So now it's all set, ready to go. Now, once you've got the list of effective pages working with all the dummy text, then you start to actually create the, um, the revisions and update it as necessary. So as an example, I'll go back to chapter one, one dash one, it's currently revision zero. It's got 628.23. I go here and I add a couple of changes. Perhaps I remove the word background and I add the word various. And then because I've made some changes here, I go up to the revision date and number and I make some changes. Potentially this is revision 001 and the date might be the 29th. And um, then I can go back to my list of effective pages. And when I update my book, watch this line right here. It's the only thing I change. As I update my book, you'll see it's gonna pick up the new revision number and the new revision date, the 29th. And that's the list of effective pages. Well, we did it. We got through the review and collaboration workflows in FrameMaker, and we also got a look at how to create a list of effective pages. I want to thank all of you for joining me today. It was a pleasure working with you once again. You know that on Bar Binder with Rocky Mountain Training, I have public training classes. I can do private training classes. I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching for an hour or two to answer various questions, usually from my past students, but you all are welcome to look into coaching with me as well. All my contact information is on the screen and the best place to get answers to your questions quickly is the Adobe Community Forums. I'll look forward to seeing you online there. Thanks everybody.